you know how we say that sometimes there's that one crazy person in every crowd. <laughs> I'm going home. Man. I want to talk to this side of the room. I want to talk to this side of the room. So I heard a story. I heard a story. All right. We as ministers, we, uh, we get involved in lots of things throughout our lives, throughout our careers, part of being a minister. And some of those are the funerals. Now imagine being a young minister, new in a small town, and you're doing a funeral. You get the funeral over, and now you're following the the hearse out to the graveside for the graveside service. The graveside service is at the, cemetery, at the city cemetery, which happens to be up on a hill. Like us, the roads weren't in the best conditions, washed out a little bit. As they're going up the hill in this old hearse, this old beaten up Cadillac hearse, the back door comes open. The casket comes out. Thump, 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 down the hill, into town. What do you do? You run after the casket, right? So there you are with the pallbearers running after the casket, trying to stop this casket. How many of you guys have ever picked up a casket before? They're heavy, right? You just can't grab hold of these things to stop them. So you're running after the casket, dum, 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 you're running down, running down the thing. It's bouncing off there. It's, it's wet and everything. It's kind of sliding around the streets, bouncing off. It, it ends up inside the pharmacy. One of the pallbearers, being as smart aleck he is, asked the pharmacist, do you have anything to stop this coffin? <laughs> wow. All right. Not bad. All right. Not bad. <laughs> I'll be here all week. <laughs> I can't claim credit for that one. I got that from Doug Peterson, so thanks, Doug, for that one. That was well done. All right. See, I can, I can tell a good joke if I have to. Just not very often. All right. Man, like right now. All right. You guys are killing me. All right. Joshua 18. Time to get serious, folks. Joshua 18. You're going to pull out your Bibles there. Page 227. Follow along with me. We're going to be in this today. Joshua 18, page 227. We've been going in our series on being courageous, keeping the main thing the main thing. What is the main thing at Grace Baptist? What are we here for? We're here to what? Say it with me. Make mature followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the maturing process. We're going to talk about us as individuals. Last week we talked kind of about where we as a church, as a corporate body, Maybe headed where we believe the leadership is where we we as a leadership believe God's taking us. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about us as individuals. What does God want for us as individuals in this maturing process? What does this look like? Before we get started, let's open up with a word of prayer. God, we praise you today for being a God who speaks to us. You speak to us through your word. And Lord, I thank you for that. And today, as we prepare our hearts for this, I ask that you would that you would make your message clear to each of us. And Lord, help us to be willing to listen and then also willing to obey. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So the title is, Are We a Swiss Church? Now, I don't mean a church full of holes like Swiss cheese, all right? Are we a Swiss church? What I mean is this, let's look at the sermon idea, is that it's easy to be neutral Swiss, the country of Switzerland is a what country? A neutral country. They're known for that. You look at the history of World War II, leading on, they are a neutral country, really unwilling to get into many conflicts at all, right? They're just, they're pretty passive. They, in their banking industries, we understand it's been a frustration. Some of the things that they're, they're willing to, to cater to anybody and everybody. We're just going to be neutral. Whatever. We're going to stay out of it. We're going to stay out of the politics. We're going to stay out of whatever it is. We're going to provide whatever services. We're just going to stay, you know, it's nothing against anybody. We're going to provide for everyone. So whether it's people with, uh, who just want to have an account over in Switzerland for the fun of it, whether it's terrorist nations, whatever it is, Switzerland is going to stay neutral. They're going to stay out of it. Bring it in here, whatever it is, just keep the politics out. We're not going to get involved. It's easy to be neutral. It's easy to be like the Swiss. 
It's easy to stay passive and not get involved in life's events. The problem is we miss out on many blessings when we never get it in gear. Just like the children of Israel, at some point we need to recognize that God wants us to get it in gear and keep the main thing the main thing. This week as I was preparing for this message, I was reminded of, of a movie, one that I never actually watched, but I remember the, the, the idea behind it. And so I looked up this week on Plugged In Online, gave some pretty good reviews, focused on the family, and then even Roger Ebert, Roger Ebert himself had a pretty good review on it. It's a movie called Click with Adam Sandler. Reading the reviews, I don't recommend watching the movie, but there's a storyline there that I think is relevant for us. In the movie Click, you have this actor, his name is Michael, he's played by Adam Sandler, who's, who's frustrated by life. And at one point, he finds himself in Bed Bath & Beyond looking for a universal remote for all of his electronics. Well, in Bed Bath & Beyond, he finds the door at the back of the building marked Beyond. So he goes to the door marked Beyond. And in that door, he finds an individual who sells him a universal remote. And it's not until he gets home that he realizes that remote doesn't just run all of his electronics, that remote runs the universe. He can hit stop, he can hit pause, fast forward, skip through certain sections. And so he learns that if there's a conflict with him and his wife, he can, he can fast forward through that, he can skip it. If there's something he doesn't enjoy about life, he can jump ahead. If there's somebody being mean to him, he can push pause and he can lash out at them in all sorts of physical violent ways when they just have to stand there and take it because their life is being paused while he punches him in the face. In the middle of this, he loses a lot. In the end, he loses his wife, he loses his kids, he loses his health because he fast forwards through everything and really loses everything. And Roger Ebert he makes comment in his, he said it's, I, I like the quote that he said in this. He said, you know what? He said the movie's being sold as a comedy, but it isn't funny. He said, yes, there are some laughs, such as when he can find, he can turn the dogs barking up and down in volume. He can play around with the hue and contrast and turn himself green. When he discovers a picture-in-picture -picture features that allows him to watch the ball game no matter what else is going on around him. But the movie essentially involves a workaholic who uses the universal remote to skip over all the bad stuff in his life and discovers in the process that he is missing life itself. Take away the gimmick of the universal remote and this is what a lot of us do and it's sad. That's a quote from Roger Ebert. That's an interesting quote to think about. How many of us in our lives wish we had that universal remote how many of us in our lives sometimes live like we had that universal remote? We tune out those things that bug us. We ignore those things that bother us. We, as much as possible, try to slow down the, the good, happy moments while ignoring the tough scenes. Eventually in the movie, Michael realizes the family dog has died and been replaced by another. His kids have grown up. His wife is married to someone else and he weighs 400 pounds and it all happened while he wasn't paying attention. How many of our lives and our lives lose things because we weren't paying attention? We never got it in gear. We were essentially Swiss. We were in neutral. Joshua chapter 18 challenges us to get it out of neutral. Joshua 18 challenges us as people to do something. In Joshua chapter 18, go ahead and turn there. Joshua chapter 18, we read about the children of Israel for the first time as a nation setting up a house of worship. And we learn in Joshua 18 verse 1, so the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there and the land lay subdued before them. There was worship that happened. For the first time, the people of Israel got together and worshiped. But in the worship, as we read on the chapter, we're going to read that this worship and this introspection, this looking inward, they go hand in hand. And today, we as a congregation, we're going to be looking inward just a little bit, maybe a lot. 
We're going to be learning as we're coming together here to worship God, we're going to be learning some things about ourselves, maybe asking some questions about ourselves that might be a little difficult. But worship and introspection go hand in hand because what happens is it reveals where we are. Verse 2, there remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. There are only 12 tribes. Seven of them had not yet received their reward, had not yet went out and taken the blessing that God had given them. You sit there and you wonder in the Church of America today how true that is for the people sitting in the chairs, sitting in the pews, sitting in the theater seats, wherever they happen to be. How many of the congregation is there every Sunday and they've never really received a reward? They've never really done what God wanted them to do and as such, they're missing out on a blessing. Seven tribes among 12 had not yet done what they were supposed to do. That moment of worship, that moment of coming together revealed where they were as people. This is a map of the nation. The different colored areas are where the different tribes are. There were 12 tribes divided out. The yellow circle I have right there is where Shiloh is. So it's right in the center. So in the center of this country, they come together for the first time and they're worshiping, they're worshiping God right around Shiloh. And it's an amazing time for them as they celebrate. They've conquered this whole land. It's theirs to take, and yet seven tribes have been unwilling to do so. Joshua, being the leader that he was, he recognized this, and he says, you know, it was obvious that some people had not yet taken possession. And Joshua, in chapter 3, he says to them, Joshua said to the people of Israel, how long, sorry, verse 3 of chapter 18, how long will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? How long are you going to wait? It's there. It's ready to be taken. How long before you get up and do something? How long before you get in gear? How long before you focus on this world, on this life that's happening around you? How long until you miss or until you stop missing the blessing? How long? What's it going to take, folks? Let's get going already. Keep the main thing the main thing. The people of Israel are supposed to come in and conquer the land and then take the land as their possession and live there and reside there and... They weren't done, and they were quitting. They were going passive. How long? Well, Joshua challenged them, verse 4. He said, provide three men from each tribe. Some translations say, choose three men from each tribe. I want you to choose. I want you to stand up. You have a role to do. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to choose. You're going to find somebody. You as a congregation are going to do something. You're going to choose three men. They're going to come to me, and then they're going to go. And he says in verse 4, he says, And I will send them out that they may set out and go. They will go up and down the land. And they're going to have a work that they're going to have to do. He says, They shall write a description of it with a view to their inheritance, and then come to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south. The house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. And I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. And then he gives specific instructions for the tribe of Levi. He says, the Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. But he tells the nation, he says, look, choose three men, have them go, they're going to map this place out, there's a work that they have to do, and then you're going to receive the reward, beginning in verse 8. So the men arose and went. Joshua charged those who went to write the description of the land, saying, go up and down in the land, write a description and return to me, and I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went, passed up and down the land, and wrote in a book a description of it by towns and seven divisions. Then they came to Joshua to the camp of Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua apportioned the land to the people of Israel, to each his portion. Then the remainder of Joshua, 18, running into 19, moving into 20, talking some about this inheritance that they received about breaking up the land, dividing the land, about the reward that they received. Joshua looked at them, they came together to worship, and Joshua looked at them and said, look, you guys are missing out. You're missing out on this. Get up and do something. Get up and do something. It begins with choosing. 
Choosing, really, is where it begins. Am I going to do something? Am I going to do this simple thing? Am I going to choose three men? Are they going to go? Are they going to do the work to receive the reward? That's a question all of us have to ask. Well, we're here today to worship. We're here today. In our own Shiloh, St. Paul, Nebraska. Pretty close to the geographic center of the United States, proportionally, right? Not too far off from the center. Who are we as a church? Well, we understand that we're Christ-centered, Bible-based. We're here because of, really, what Christ did on the cross. This very morning, Leola Burkhart, one of our beloved members, this very morning, she may be allowed to enter in the presence of our Lord. What a blessing that would be. And it's hard for us to think about that. We grieve that as a family, even now, is gathered by her bedside at the hospital. But you know what? Being Christ-centered means we are Christ-focused. means we're always thinking about the fact, you know what, at any moment in time, we could be in the presence of our Lord. All because of what he did for us on the cross. And then we look at God's word and we say, you know what, we're Christ-centered, Bible-focused, this is, what, this, is, this is it. We're based on God's word. This is, the, this is our reality. Our foundation is right here. It's not what man thinks. It's not psychology. It's none of those things. It's not the wisdom of man. We're gonna talk about that in Sunday school later. We're talking about God's word. We are Christ-centered, Bible-based, and we are here to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Now, part of that process, of course, is as we're here to make mature followers of Jesus Christ, that also means that we, as people, we have a role to also become a mature follower of Jesus Christ. Because if everyone in here wanted to make a mature follower, but nobody wanted to become a mature follower, would it be fulfilling our purpose? No. Maybe half of it. And it'd be like seven tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. Like, God, we're, we're making mature followers. And God's like, yeah, but you're not becoming mature. How long are you going to sit there before you get up to receive the reward? So the question for all of us as individuals, as people, ask yourself this. Are you neutral in accomplishing this? Have you in the last year become more mature in one area of your life? Have you in the last year helped somebody become more mature in an area in their life? Are you one of the seven tribes who's just sitting around waiting? It's ready to be taken. The job is there, but you're not doing anything. How long? How long, as Joshua says? Well, you sit there and think, Pastor, it's easy for you to say, so we, there's personal problems out there. There's a lot distracting us from this. There's a lot keeping us from accomplishing this. Look at some of the things that's going on in the society around us. We understand that individual debt is 13.51 trillion. So what about individuals in the U.S.? People in this church have debt loads. They're financially in trouble. And so for them, it's, they're just trying to survive day by day. I don't have time to think about helping somebody mature or myself mature. I'm just trying to stay, stay financially solvent without losing everything. Marriages are in trouble. Current divorce rate at 39%. You say, hey, that's better than it was a few years ago. And that's true, but only because cohabitation's on the rise. Cohabitation is multiplying. People aren't getting married. They're just living together. So of course divorce rates are going to go down. Marriages are in trouble. Some of us here in this church, they're thinking, you know what? I don't like my spouse. My spouse doesn't like me. That's a distraction. I don't have time to help somebody become mature. I got this going on in my life. Faith. Fewer and fewer people believe the Bible is God's word without error and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. We sit there and think, some of us, we're struggling even in this area. Is God's word true? Is Jesus the only way to heaven? These are distractions for us. Look at this quote from John Dickerson. By multiple accounts, evangelical believers are between 7 and 9% of the U.S. population and we lose about 2.6 million of those each decade. Written in the book called The Great Evangelical Recession, it was a terrifying book to read, let me tell you, because of the stats that he quoted. This one came after he looked at two studies, or four studies, two of them were secular, two of them were Christian studies, all four of which came back with this number. Seven to nine percent of people, okay, in the U.S. believe the Bible is true without error and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Statistically, in St. Paul, a town of 2,300 people, 
two, at 9%, figuring 9%, 207 people believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that God's word is true as is written. Only 207 of your neighbors, us included, believe that in St. Paul. That is a terrifying statistic. Now, we could be in a pocket where there's more than that. But let me tell you, the majority of St. Paul is not going to believe that God's word is true as it is written, and the majority are not going to believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. We have a faith problem. We have a big faith problem in St. Paul. So, understanding this, understanding that personal problem, what else do we have? Well, we, we understand that because of, number three, you've got to recognize that moral, number four is happening, moral decline. Look at the things that is acceptable in this culture now that wasn't acceptable 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. The decline. The things that's happening in our lives. We look at even the, the decline in, in, in sexuality, the, the, that one temptation that really drags so many people down. Pornography running rampant. Homosexuality running rampant. All these different things is happening. The decline. People, it's all about what I want. It doesn't necessarily matter what you want, it's what I want. I'm here for myself, not for you. There's a moral decline in our nation. Parental confusion. Whose job is it? His job? Her job? Do we discipline our kids? Do we not discipline them? Do we do it like our grandparents or not? Do we teach gender and or traditional roles or not? And you think, well, that's not really a problem. It is. I've got a friend, family friend of mine, who they don't even want to teach their kids, you're a boy or you're a girl. They're letting them decide. You going to do girl things as a boy? You going to do boy things as a girl? What are you going to be? You want to be four years old and have long hair and pinch your fingernails even though you're a boy? Okay, that's fine. True story, guys. Decline. We've got confusion going on. We've got a world that's just falling apart and we sit there and think, yeah, they're so distracted, it's no wonder nobody's growing up. And then, of course, for all of us, here's one denial. Pastor, I don't need to mature anymore. I'm good. Well, for me, 1 John 1, 8 kind of hit me a little bit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, if I'm going to understand God's word is true, 100% as it is written, without error, then I have to look at this verse, and I have to hear from God, say, Pastor Bear, you got sin in your life that you need to deal with. Pastor Barry, you've got some maturing to do. And every single one of us sitting here today, wow, I've got maturing to do. I've got some sin in my life that needs to be dealt with. We as a church, if we're going to make mature followers, we've got to become mature followers. We've got a task that God wants from us. And he's sitting there asking us, how long? Because there's a reward for us. There's something out there. And, and so, what's he want? so what do we do? So we choose, and we choose, I'm going to say create a map. Like the children of Israel went out and they created the map. We have to decide, God, am I broken? And the answer is yes. God, what do I got to do to get out of this mess? What plan do I have to create? What map do I have to have? And a lot of us don't know, so what do we have to do? We have to go and get help. We've got to ask people, can you help me with this? I've got a sin issue. I've got a maturity issue. I've got some problem in my life. I need help. I'm going to choose... I'm going to choose to do something. I'm going to choose to map this out. I'm going to go. I'm going to get help. And then I'm going to work at it. I'm not going to be passive anymore. I'm not going to just sit there. I'm not going to run away from it. I'm actually going to address the problems. I'm not going to take my universal remote and fast forward through life. I'm going to engage. I'm going to see things happen. I'm going to become involved. I am not going to be neutral. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a reward. There will be a reward for us. I got a list of Bible verses, and I love these verses. These verses talk about a reward for those of us in, in different areas of life. And one of my favorites I put up front, and Janet, you're going to love this because it's from Ecclesiastes. She loves Ecclesiastes. The New Living Translation. The New Living, okay? Not a version you're going to get doctrine from, but I love the message. Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. How many of you are suicidal right now? Don't answer that question. All right. <laughs> the wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. You know what? I look at that verse and I look at my bride <laughs> like, man, God, you couldn't do any better. She's my reward. 
When is the last time you as a man saw your wife as a reward? Life around us is frankly pretty meaningless as far as physical living. And God says, I've given you somebody awesome who's your reward. What are you doing with your trophy wife? Because she is. She's your reward. Guys, there's a reward waiting for us. It's already there. If you're married, it's already there. How long before you get to go out and celebrate the fact that, wow, this is awesome. Pastor, we're broken. Okay, work at it already. I was broken once too. In year 11, I thought we was going to get divorced in year 11 of our marriage. I thought we were headed there. And we worked at it. And it stunk. Let me tell you, it was not fun. But she forgave. I re-engaged because that was the only thing I had done is I had disengaged from my family. And she was saying, I can't do that anymore. I can't live like this. And I was forced to re-engage and there was a reward. Guys, the woman God's given you is your reward. When's the last time you told her that? Say, man, God gave me a great reward when he gave me you. We sit there and we're like, rawr, rawr, rawr. Right, okay, just saying. Just reading God's word, wherever it applies, let it fall, all right, moving on. Grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. Parents are the pride of their children. I want to ask you a question. How many of us know parents who are not the pride of their children and because of that are not allowed to hang out with their crowning glory, their own grandkids? We all know stories of people, of parents, who refused to acknowledge the hurts, refused to ask forgiveness, whatever it is, became estranged from their own children and missed out on their grandkids who is their crowning glory. There's a reward there for us for being parents. It's called grandkids because you get to sugar them up and send them home. And it's awesome, right? We're watching little Leah Williams at our house She's so fun because at the end of the day, four o'clock, she's going home no matter what I do to her, okay? And it's awesome. I get to experience being a grandparent without being a grandparent. I understand why it's fun. But guys, there's a job for us because we miss out on a reward if we do not parent properly. And we know people, I bet every single one of us in here knows of somebody who at least for a little period of time was unable to see their grandkids because of the way they treated their own kids. There's a maturing process. Psalm 127, children are a gift from the Lord. They're a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. Look at that. Our children are a blessing from God. They are a reward from God. They really are. I mean, sit there and, I mean, it's just fantastic. When you, need a, when you need your suburban vacuumed out, you don't have to do it anymore because you have kids. <laughs> All right, bad example, okay? But we understand, good example. All right, thanks, Thomas. So we, we know children are a blessing. When's the last time you told your kids, man, I'm glad you guys are mine? We should. I've got good kids. They mess with me more than you guys mess with me, all right? Dinner around the bear table is an interesting ordeal. It really is, but I love my kids. They're good kids. They are a reward from God, and it's a wonderful thing. Moving on. Love your enemies. Do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. He's kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Why is that? Because of this. We love our enemies and we do good and we lend expecting nothing in return. How many of us sit there and think, wow, pastor, I really stink at that. It's hard to love my enemies. Doing good, yeah, I'm okay at that, but lend expecting nothing in return? Wow, that's abnormal. Yep. It's called being a growing, maturing follower of Jesus Christ. That's what God's word says. And what happens? And... You and your reward will be great. Do you see this in here? Do you see how God is just unfolding the promised land in front of us? Saying, how long? Ecclesiastes 5, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth 
brings true happiness. And look at what Proverbs says. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous, the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. And then Paul writes to 1 Timothy, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And this next verse is key right here. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. So what? Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What's he want from us who have? He wants us to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous. Why? So that we will have a reward. So that we will be storing up treasure. That's what God wants for us. He's got a task for us to do. What's God telling you today? What does God want from you today? Galatians 6, 9, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Some of us today struggle, struggle with giving, lending without expecting anything back. Some of us struggle with that, being open-handed, I call it. Some of us are struggling in our relationship with our, with our kids, some with our relationship with our parents, some relationship with our spouses, some, frankly, with just our work. It's hard to go and do good. Some with, with school and, and whatever, because God says love your enemies, and God, that's hard to love my enemies. I don't know what you're struggling with, but I know every single one of us here, if we're honest with ourselves, and we have to be honest, if we're honest with ourselves, every single one of us is struggling with something. Every single one of us has at least one area to mature in, to grow in. What's your area? What is God calling you to do? What is it that God wants you to look at in your life and say, okay, God, this one I need to mature in. This one I need to quit being neutral. I need to stop being swiss. I need to stand up and I need to say, enough is enough. We've got to understand that all of us need to ask this question. Which area do you need to mature in the most? And maybe, you know, it's like the Dave Ramsey thing. When you, uh, when you do Dave Ramsey, he talks about the debt snowball. You don't tackle the biggest one first because that'll take you years. You hit the smallest one and then you snowball it over, okay? You get a little victory in your life, then you roll the next one, a little more victory. And so maybe the question for you is, okay, what can I get victory in? What can God help me grow in? And it may not be your biggest one. It may actually be the smallest one, but okay, here's one that I need to mature in and God can help me do this. I know I can. With God's help, I know I can. Where can you gain victory? What do you need to do? Here's the thing, you can't start any younger. Now's the time to stop being neutral and get it in gear, folks. Now's the time to do it. You can't start any younger. And all this, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And for us as a church, what's the main thing? We're here to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we're here to do. And for us, that not only involves helping someone else become mature, that involves becoming mature ourselves. Are you ready to do that? Father, <coughs> Father, this whole thing of becoming mature is very difficult. Frankly, there are days that it stinks because it requires from us things that's hard to give. That's not natural, it's not normal, but it's not normal to be conformed to the image of your son. And Lord, my prayer is that everyone in this room would like to have that would like to be conformed, would like to become conformed to the image of your son. And Lord, that's going to require a maturing process. But as we do it, someday we're going to stand before you in heaven. We're going to be in your presence just like Leola possibly this week is going to do that. And Lord, when that happens, we pray that when you see us, you look at us and you say, well done. Well done. Because Lord, we are all going to be in your presence and Lord, I pray that all of us be able to hear those words, well done. God, I thank you for the gift of your son. That's allowed us to have a relationship with you so someday we may indeed, all who place our faith in you, we may indeed get to heaven. Father, what a day that's gonna be. And God, thank you for maturing us in the process, for maturing us along the way, for leading us, for growing us, for guiding us. And God, thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.